Like a King Part 2. I like to start off saying tonight word may be a little challenging. You may be offended. I think the last time I talked, I don't know, man, TikTok be coming up with these filters, bro. I don't know if it's the juice I'm drinking or it's the filter, but my skin doing something. I promise you I ain't got no filter, no filter on. So, um, but anyway, last time I talked about this topic that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, a lot of people got offended. Uh, and a lot of people got offended and actually left the community. I said, okay, Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit will trigger you sometimes. And it, it, it could be offensive and it can be challenging. But you don't go to the gym and get no results unless you are challenged. If it won't challenge you, you it won't change you. And y'all already know the type of word that I give. It don't always feel good, but guess what? We're growing. You are growing. Since you've been connected to this community, you have been growing. So although it may not feel good all the time, it's helping you grow. And we have been talking about David again. We're going to be talking about David for quite a while. And David has been running for his life. And it's easy. It's easy for us to become selfish in our suffering when we are barely keeping our head above water. But the whole time is God developing us. David's mindset has shifted from being selfish. Not necessarily selfish, but now God has brought a group of people into his life where David is more concerned about the people than he is himself, himself. And God had to do the same thing with me because my life was only majority of my life. Everything was about Reggie. Where are you going to college? What you going to do this weekend? What you going to do when you wake up? Uh, how you need to dress? Uh, what's your five year plan? What's your 10 year plan? Everything goes about Reggie. But when God started to work on me and challenge me and correct me, my mind shifted from being all about Reggie until to purpose to Reggie. How are you helping my people? And that's where David is in chapter 22 and chapter 23. I've been guilty. I, Reggie Taylor, have been guilty of doing a poor job of managing my emotions throughout the years. And when God is shifting your mindset from a selfish mindset to a purpose mindset, one of the things he's going to address are your emotions. I've been guilty of doing a poor job of managing my emotions for 95 percent of my life. And I really don't have nobody to blame. After a certain age, I stopped blaming people. But what I am going to do is, is give you some insight and give you a testimony of why I think or why I did a poor job of managing my emotions. And some of you, especially men, struggle in this area. I grew up in a household, both parents. My parents been married for quite a long time. And what I tell y'all, this ain't condemning my parents or throwing my parents under the bus. This just me telling you my childhood. This ain't no prescription. It's description. I mean, I'm describing to you what took place in my childhood, which molded me and conditioned me to think a certain way, which was toxic to my calling and toxic to my pur purpose. I had a lot of cut. I had a few cousins, older cousins. I always was the run of the bunch, kind of like David, kind of like Joseph. I was the youngest. So my mama used to drop me off at my aunt house. And I had some older cousins. They were older and they were bigger. So early in my childhood, I was conditioned to suppress my emotions. Let me tell you why. Because if we're in the living room, watching wrestling, watching Bruce Lee, watching any type of karate movie. When we go outside to play, them same moves that they watched on their wrestling and in, on the karate movie, they about to try all them moves on your boy. So we go out in the yard 
They suplexing, they body slamming. I don't have no mat. I don't have no rope. And all them moves, they practicing on me now. But when I was start to almost cry because you just body slammed me on my head and my ears are ringing and I'm seeing stars. If I started to cry, what would my older cousin say? Take the pain. Take the pain, Reggie. Don't cry. Because if I go in the house crying, all of us going to get a whooping. I'm going to get a whooping. My cousin's going to get a whooping. Everybody in the yard going to get a whooping if Reggie go in the house crying. So they'll be like, take the pain. Take the pain. So now I'm, I'm, I'm conditioned to not even feel just from my childhood on the playground. I grew up in a household. Well, shut up before I give you something to cry about. Yeah, I grew up in a household where it was spatter rod, spoiled a child. I got whooped. I got a whole bunch of whoopings. I got beat. Every little thing. You leave the milk out, you're getting beat. If I come in there and you, you on the game, you're getting beat. If you bring home a B minus, you're getting beat. You got a B minus in conduct because you talk too much. You're getting beat. I got beat for everything. Spatter rod, spoiled a child. We have straight butchered that scripture. That scripture don't mean how we've implemented it in the kingdom, especially in the black community. We have butchered it. But that's the type of childhood that I grew up in. So I'm getting beat. But as soon as I start crying, shut up before I give you something to cry about. So now I'm getting conditioned to not feel on the playground. I'm getting conditioned or learning to not feel in the household. I'm conditioned as a five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve 10, 11, 12 year old. And now that I'm older in college trying to interact with women and the woman asking me why I'm so numb, why I don't feel is because in my childhood they had conditioned me to not feel. I can't cry. Even if I hurt, I can't cry. That was a that was a a, a, a sign of weakness in my childhood. You cry, you weak, you a punk. So, so now I, I'm conditioned to think like that. And now I don't really know how to love a woman. I don't really know how to show her affection. I don't really know how to express my emotions because y'all told me not to, not to feel. I didn't tell my mama I loved her until I was in my 20s. Yeah. That I love you? Oh, no. Nah, that made me feel all funny. I didn't grow up in a loving household. Ain't no hugging. Mm-mm. None of that. I didn't tell my mom I loved her until I was, had left college. I struggled with that for a long time. And a lot of men struggle with that. And you don't understand why your man or why the men in your life think like that is because they were brought up like me. But the only type of emotion that I will feel is anger. Oh, I would, I would, oh yeah, I'll snap on you, like for real. Very confrontational. I'll show you anger, but when it comes to that healthy form of communicating with other people that I cared about them, I struggled in that area for quite a long time, and I still struggle with it to a certain extent. Not as bad as I used to, but I still struggle. I had, I had to renew my mind. And say, Reggie, you can't effect effectively do life based off of how you were brought up. I was numb and emotionally dumb. Numb, but emotionally dumb. However, that's just me. I was numb. Suppress my feelings, don't show no emotion, that's me. However, there are some of us in the kingdom who are too emotional. Some of us too emotional. But whether you are too emotional or don't show no emotion at all, the Holy Spirit can address both of, both of them. Whatever your struggle is emotionally, the Holy Spirit can address both of them. Whether you're numb or whether you are too emotional. And this message is for men and women. Both.
Men and women in the kingdom aren't very emotional intelligent. And if you want to shift your mindset from being selfish to purpose to people, you got to learn how to manage your emotions. And I don't care nothing about no testosterone and I don't care nothing about no estrogen. We all have to do a better job of managing our emotions. It don't matter if you're a man or woman, because a lot of us gonna use the excuse that um, my estrogen, it's the fact that I'm a woman. No, you still need to learn how to manage your emotions. Or you may be a man who using testosterone for you to be numb and not hug your kids or not tell your son that you love him or not allow your son to be a human because you teaching them to be too tough. He don't have the capacity to have compassion or empathy. My dad told me for a long time, hey, you got to stop sleeping with all them women. You need to stop dogging them women out. But the fact that you taught me as a kid not to feel, that's why I have the ability to do what I do towards a woman because I don't feel. When she cry, I'm looking at her like she's stupid. Like, what you crying for? I can't feel. I can't feel. I can't feel. I can't, so I don't care what I say to you. I'll put you out of my house. I don't care because I I can't empathize with you because I, I can't feel. Some of us are too emotional, argumentative, offended. You shut down. Your shutdown game is real strong. That ain't nothing for you to brag about. You do a poor job of managing your emotions. If your shutdown game is real quick, that's another form of anger. You just ain't cursing, but you're punishing the other person by saying, hey, I'm going to abandon you emotionally because you hurt me or you didn't do what I wanted you to do. So I'm going to shut down. You still got anger issues. Irritable. Somebody ask you a simple question and you snappy. Impulsive. You do whatever you feel like. And you get out temper tantrums. And you're 40. That's a problem. That's a problem when you don't get your way and you have a temper tantrum. That's a problem. I was known. Some of us are too emotional. When we are overly emotional, if you are one of those people who are overly emotional, we typically compromise the well being of others because you don't really care how your actions impact nobody else. You're just loyal to your emotions and to your feelings. That's all that matters to you. So you'll break up or file for a divorce over a simple disagreement because you don't you don't know how to manage your emotions. You don't know how to disagree and still come together and love each other and have a conversation. But you sat down on folks just because they disagree with you. And you've been saved 20 years. We are typically selfish when we are led by our emotions. But the topic tonight is like a king. Kings in the kingdom, kings in the kingdom, queens in the kingdom are not led by our emotions. But let me Stick a pin here because somebody go twist what I said. You probably already twisted. I see it. I did not say don't feel. That's not what I'm saying. I did not say not feel. What I said was don't be led by your emotions. Feel, but don't worship. Feel, but don't be led by your emotions. And we had not really talked about this in the kingdom, but sometimes our emotions, our feelings have become our idols. Yeah, you idolize your feelings. Mm -hmm. You may not be worshiping Buddha. Mm -mm. You may not be worshiping crystals or burning sage or, you know, I don't believe in the zodiacs and yesterday was valentine's day but you know valentine's day is pagan and stuff like that like i don't do that stuff i go to church i went to bible study last night i'm in my devotion all the time and i'm always on reggie's live and i speak in tongues and the holy spirit comes upon me but as soon as somebody trigger you you respond 
you, dear, are a victim of your emotions and you idolize your emotions, but you speak in tongues because ain't nobody brought it to your attention. When you offend it, you flee. When you are offended, you flee or you act out instead of sitting down saying, hey, uh, yeah, yo, can, can you please explain to me uh, what you meant the other night? Uh, I felt some type of weight. I don't know if it's me or you, but can we sit down and have a conversation? You get what I'm saying? Because I'm I'm feeling some type of weight and, I, and, and the Lord is working on me in this area. So before I flee or before I act out, let me not let me sit down and think logically and sit down and have a whole conversation. But now nah, we don't do that. We struggle with that in the kingdom. I see it all the time. I see it in the world. I see it in the kingdom. I see it amongst men. I see it amongst women. I see it in the teenagers. I see it in the older folks. I see it everywhere. So I watched the Super Bowl, right? Didn't really have a dog in the fight. And so everybody knows that I'm a huge football fan. I prefer college football over any sport. But you know what I'm saying? I watch the NFL for entertainment. But I don't typically watch the game like everybody else watch watch it i'm a people watcher like I, I analyze and i look at human behavior not to critique and, and, and to condemn but to just see how people think i'll watch some reality tv just to see how people think just to see what's the mental of the culture that's out here dating that's out here getting married i just watch it just i ain't just watching it for entertainment i don't watch football for entertainment i'm watching it because i'm learning that's just how I'm wired. So I'm watching the NFL, right? And uh, it's the Baltimore Ravens, not in the Super Bowl, but the game before the Super Bowl. It's the Baltimore Ravens and it's the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't have a dog in the fight. I like Lamar Jackson because I used to follow him in college. You know, great athlete. Uh, they say he wouldn't do well in the NFL. So I'm, I'm rooting for him, trying to see what he's talking about. And plus... Uh, the Ravens got a couple of Bama boys on their team. But it, it's certain instances in the game where I, I, I saw where the Chiefs and the Ravens, it, it, the Chiefs seemed a little bit more mature than the Ravens. I'll give you one example. If you watch football, if you don't, just be patient with your boy. The Baltimore Ravens got a player named Zay Flowers. Exceptional receiver. Super fast. Got quick feet and everything. The Baltimore Ravens were struggling moving the ball. They couldn't really move it. Lamar Jackson was struggling. They couldn't really get the ball down the field. But Lamar made a pass, a long pass. It was about 35, 40 yards. Let me tell you what Zay Flowers did. Zay Flowers pushed the defender down. Now, the whistle blow, the play over, he pushed the, pushed the defender down, spent the ball, Stood over him, said something to him. The ref threw a flag. 15-yard penalty. So even though the play was supposed to be 45 yards, it only was 30 yards because you allowed your emotions to get the best of you. I'm not saying, I'm not saying you the reason the Ravens lost, but I'm saying that moment he was selfish and what I said earlier. When we are typically selfish or overly emotional, we compromise the well-being of others. At that moment, Zay Flowers, you didn't take into consideration, bro. You, you just messed up a whole scoring drive because of your emotions. But check this out. I give grace. Okay, cool. Not shortly after that, Zay Flowers going into the end zone, extend the ball out. The Kansas City player knocked it out of his hand. He fumbled in the end zone. So instead of being a touchdown, it was a touchback. Two instances, bro, where you let your emotions get the best of you. I understand. But it, you can take that revelation from that football game and correlate it over to everyday life. One moment that you submit yourself to your emotions Without logic, could be the difference between a touchback and a touchdown. It could be the difference between life 
or death. But I give grace again. That's the second time Zay Flowers messed up. But he was so upset by the fact he fumbled the ball, he went to the sideline and punched something, messed his hand up. Now you're injured, and you're the best receiver on the team. Bro, you just kept compromised the entire success of your team because of your selfish mindset. That's how I'm watching the game. And shortly after that, I started to see how the Ravens, the team overall, was too emotional. They ended up losing. They had a lot of penalties, so on and so forth. This, that's how I watch the game. I'm, I'm looking at the players, but I'm looking at how they interact and all that good stuff. So you fast forward into the Super Bowl. Watching the Super Bowl. I ain't really got no dog in the fight, but I wanted the 49ers to win. The 49ers get the ball first. They driving down the field. The first red flag that I saw with the 49ers relative to being emotionally mature, I think their fullback caught a pass, 10 yard pass, but it took off and in the middle of the field, he jumped. Now, if you're a football player and if you watch any type of sports, you know it's a no-no to jump. The risk of injury goes through the roof when you jump. He had three defenders around him. I'm like, bro, you're a fullback. You ain't LeBron. You ain't Michael Jordan. Why are you jumping? Some of, some of us don't see no, no big deal with it. But what I'm saying, he was too emotional. Because what he did did not make sense. Why are you jumping, bro? You ain't finna jump over nobody. But because you hype, you lit. Not only that, every time y'all got a first down, everybody just excited. Let's go. First down. All of this on the first drive, and then you get down in the red zone, and Christian McCaffrey, McCaffrey fumble the ball. I'm not blaming Christian McCaffrey. What I'm saying, I saw the red flags before the first quarter. Like, 49ers were too emotional. You can't be effective in sports and be too emotional. Because your emotions go have you all over the place. You're going to make penalties. You're not locked in like you need to be. And some of us not locked in like we need to be in life because we are being led by our emotions. And sometimes the fact that we are loyal to our emotions, the decisions that we make do not make sense. I hope y'all like football. If not, I appreciate your patience. But that's how I watch the game. I'm just looking at the players so I can learn. So I can learn to stop going back and forth in the comment section when I'm on here in a football game. Not to get distracted or not make a bad decision because of my emotions. Four ways that God helped me manage my emotions. The bottom line is how to manage your emotions or learn to manage your emotions. Your devotion. Write it down. The number one way where God will help you manage your emotions, the Holy Spirit will help you manage your emotions, whether you're too numb or too emotional, is tied to your devotion. What is your devotion? Your time spent with God. Secondly, fasting. Fasting will help you manage your emotions. If you can control your belly, you can almost control any other part. No, if you can control your be belly, it's going to control that tongue, that smart mouth you got. It's going to control that. It's going to control this. It's going to control your feet, your hands, your eyes, and everything if you learn to start fasting. Thirdly, when you spend time with God, he starts to open your eyes. He starts showing you you. He starts showing you you. For example, you could be watching a movie and you, you'll see, uh, you'll be like, man, why, why Buddy talking to his wife like that? Man, this dude crazy, bro. You see how he talking to his wife? She just asked you a simple question, bro. And you, you cursed her out. I understand you had a long day, but why you curse her out? God said, you do the same thing. You do the same thing, my boy. And when I started seeing myself in other people, I was like, ooh, that look bad. Bro, dang, Reggie, you do the same thing. He starts to open your eyes. 
Yeah, you do the same thing. Fourthly, he places you in, in environments that develop this skill. He places you in environments to develop this skill. Emotional management, managing your emotions. So he placed me in an environment where I'm in corporate America. And bro, now that you're in leadership, you're actually over leaders. You got to learn how to manage your emotions. You just can't suspend somebody because you in your feelings. Because guess what? If you suspend them, you are already shorthanded. Who go cover their workload? So now you took another leader to cover their workload, which means the leader that was over these 25 guys, those 25 guys now feel neglected. So now that their leader is having to cover the shift of the dude that you suspended because of your feelings, three or four of them are upset. Now three or four of them have put their two weeks notice in. So now you got to hire somebody or find two or three other leaders to cover the other two or three people who are upset because their leader is having to cover a shift over the dude that you suspended all because of your emotions. So now you have made your job more difficult because you made an impulsive decision from your emotions instead of having a heart. You just want to say, okay, cool. So God said, I'm going to place you in an environment, my boy, to help you manage your emotions. This is training. This is not punishment. So God put me in corporate America, America to cultivate this ability to manage my emotions. I did not go to the altar and start speaking in tongues. Some of us are running from, from situations God have, has placed us in for development. To manage your emotions. But you ran away from it. Or you quit. That was for training. Let me tell you why we can't be developed. I could have easily walked away from that job. Because it got difficult. But I consulted with the Lord and said. Hey God I know this is difficult. I know this is uncomfortable. But is it time for me to leave? God said no this is your training. When you don't consult with the Lord. What the Lord has sent into your life for training. You will quit. Because it don't feel good. We got to stop making decisions because it don't feel good. Kings don't do that. Tonight, let's talk about what happens when we fall victim to not responding properly to our emotions or the inability to manage our emotions. As I stated earlier, David is on the run for his life for King Saul. And David has gone from the field to the palace. Now he in a cave. Writing Psalms to God saying, God, protect me, keep me, keep me hidden from King Saul. He's trying to unalive me. And David has now been brought out of the cave and God has blessed him with his family back in his life. And now he's over an army. And I'll read the first three verses for the people who weren't here last time. First Samuel 23. And so one day news came to David that the Philistines, that's the enemy, were at Keilah stealing grain from the threshing floors. David asked the Lord, should I go and attack them? Now, because David has gone through process, David is not doing what he feel like doing. Yeah, it feel like I should go help these people. It feel like I should give them some money. It feel like I should mentor them. David said, no, God has taken me through a process where I'm not going to listen to my feelings. I hear them, but let me check with the Lord first. So David said, God, should I go attack them? I know they attacking my people, but should I go save them? The Lord said, yes, go and save Keilah. But David's men said, we're afraid even here in Judah. We certainly don't want to go to Keilah to fight the whole Philistine army. But check this out. I know we read this last time. I know we read this last time. But I want to I want to paint this picture with where David is. David is probably more afraid now than he was a couple of weeks ago. Let me tell you why. David is probably more afraid 
because King Saul has just unalived 85 priests. This is the first time King Saul has ever unalived a person of his same ethnicity. King Saul's mindset has become so corrupt that he's killing not only other Jews, he's killing priests. So if you didn't know whether or not King Saul was crazy, you know for sure he's crazy now because he's unaliving church folks and he unaliving people of his own ethnicity. Mm. So if you were in anywhere in your mind where you'd be like, man, King David probably just tripping. Nah, this joker crazy for real. He, he unaliving priest. So now David probably more afraid than he was a couple of weeks ago. But check this out, though. David, men were scared to go to Keilah. Verse four says, so David asked the Lord again and the Lord replied, go down to Keilah for I will help you conquer the Philistines. So David at verse five. So David and his men went to Keilah. They slaughtered the Philistines and took all their livestock and rescued the people of Keilah. Now, when Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, fled to David at Keilah, he brought the ephod with him. So check this out. Abiathar was one of the priests that escaped. Saul unalived 85 priests. But Abiathar was one of the priests that actually escaped. But check this out, though. Abiathar brought the ephod. It says right here, David asked the Lord, should we go down to Keilah? Go down to Keilah. They were successful. But verse 6 says, Abiathar, son of Ahimelech, fled to David and he brought the ephod. What's the ephod? We've talked about it before, but if you don't know what some of these terms mean in the Bible, I encourage you to get this book right here. Let's see what an ephod is. I know what it is, but some of y'all don't know what it is. So I'm going to look it up and tell you because sometimes we read too fast. And the reason why we don't understand the Bible, because we don't look these words up. We just like reading fast. Say, I read five chapters last night. And don't understand nothing. An uh, ephod is the vestment or waistcoat worn by priests in the execution of their official duties, especially in consulting the Urim and Thummim. What's the Urim and Thummim? Let's go look it up right quick. What's the Urim? What's the Thummim? The Urim and Thummim say it is lights and perfection. It's tools given by the Lord for soliciting or obtaining the will of Yahweh by his priest and sometimes his kings. What are you saying, Reggie? I'm saying back then they didn't have access to the Holy Spirit like we have. The Holy Spirit would come upon them in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, after Jesus resurrected, the Holy Spirit is within us. So the fact that they didn't have the Holy Spirit within them, they would have to rely on priests and prophets who had the ephod and the Urim and Thurim were like stones on this vest where they would ask God, yes or no. And God would say either yes or no relative to which stone would light up. Don't want to go in great, great detail with that, but that's what the Urim and Thurim is. It's pretty much a representation of the Holy Spirit when people need to know what to do when it comes to hearing God's voice. And it says in verse six that David was successful. So verse seven says Saul soon learned that David was at Keilah. Good. He exclaimed. We got him now. Oh, yeah. We got him now, bro. God has handed him over to me for he has trapped himself in a wild, wild town. And so Saul mobilized his entire army to march to Keilah and besiege David and his men. Hold up, Saul. Hold up, my boy. We 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 read about you, my boy. We already know you don't. We already know you don't have no relationship with God. We already know you don't have no relationship with God. But but you got feelings, right? And we know that you hate David, 
We know that you're jealous of David and you want to unalive him for no reason. We know that now. Strong feelings, but no relationship with God. That's a bad combination. When you have strong feelings and no relationship with God, you got to be careful. That you don't think because you had a dream about something that is that is God. Because you got strong feelings. Saul right here got strong feelings, but he lacked relationship with God. And I'm almost positive. I won't say I'm almost positive, but it wouldn't surprise me if King Saul is actually dreaming about unaliving Saul because he got strong feelings. Sometimes when you feel strongly about something, your subconscious go make you dream about it. So yeah, Reggie, your husband, I'm calling Cap. Seven or eight people have told me I'm their husbands. You just got strong feelings. And why God talking to you about a husband instead of purpose? Why? Why God talking to you about a wife instead of purpose? Why? But you got strong feelings and because you're loyal to your feelings and you dreamed about it like King Saul, he said, this is God. Look at King Saul. Hold up. I don't want to read it too fast. I don't. I don't want to read it too fast. My boy King Saul said, good. We've got him now. God has handed him God has handed him. So now you feel so strongly and now you're dreaming about it and you keep seeing it. Do you know? Do you know how powerful your mind is? So check this out. Uh, what can I use for an example? Just say you bought a red Altima. You bought a red Altima. You know what I'm saying? You got your income tax. So you'd be like, man, let me go buy me a red Altima. I got a good price. I need me a new car. I'm put me some rims on it, put some beat in the back, all that good stuff. You feel me? So when you buy that red Altima, everywhere you look, you see a red Altima. You go, into red, you go into Walmart, you see a red Altima. You pull up at the church. The girl in the choir got a red Altima. You go to the game. That parking space is, is occupied by a red Altima. So you keep seeing it. Ain't got nothing to do with God. It's got the fact that you just bought a red Altima and now your brain has made you see it in everything. You think this is this this is the Lord telling me this is the Lord. A red Altima. No, that's your brain. So now you're dreaming about it. So we have to make sure that because you're dreaming and because you keep seeing something over and over and you have a strong feeling don't mean that it's God, bro. It don't. I hate to burst the bubble, but that don't mean that it's God. You just have strong feelings. But we have to submit our feelings to the Lord so he can sift them and refine them. Because if we don't, we go end up like King Saul talking about God said, God said I should get a real ultimate. I dreamed about it. I had I dreamed about it and everything. Then as soon as I got up, I saw a red Ultima. No, bro, that's your brain. That ain't God. But King Saul think that it's God. <laughs> he said, God has handed David over. And God said, I ain't got nothing to do with that. God said, I ain't got nothing to do with that. Emotional. Emotionalism. But this is the thing that this is a challenge that we have in the kingdom, right? We've always been taught. Follow your heart. We got people on these dumb podcasts and just just follow your heart. If it's a it's a, it's a vibe. You know, we got to we got we got to have vibes. Now you see how you saw you see how we get deceived. Because vibes and energy and chemistry, that ain't nothing but your feelings. What, what did the Lord say about it? I know you had vibes, but what did the, did the Lord say? You don't care nothing about that, do you? You just respond to the vibes. Okay, that's why you're here tonight. You don't respond or start dating folks based off of no vibe. You date and marry based off the word of the Lord, not the vibe. Or their energy, or or follow your heart. Just, just follow your heart. 
You followed your heart in the last person you was with. It didn't work out, did it? But you still go follow your heart, bruh. We gotta be, we gotta be wise. I'm running out of time. Help me, Holy Spirit. Proverbs 28, 26. Proverbs 28, 26. Those who trust their own insight, some versions say heart, are foolish. But anyone who walks in wisdom is safe. That's what Proverbs 28, 26 says. Jeremiah, y'all don't have to go there because I done took y'all on a rabbit trail tonight. So I'm going to I'm going to give y'all some grace tonight. You don't have to go to these scriptures, you feel me? Because I took the wrong, I took the long road tonight. Jeremiah 17 says, verses 9 through 10, it says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Who is he talking to? He's talking to his people who have rejected him. So he's talking about the human hearts of the people who lack relationship with him. Their hearts are full of deceit. But the world tells us, <laughs> you don't folks mentor y'all and say stuff like that. Just just, just follow your heart. <laughs> y'all chill out, bro. Just follow your heart. Saul following his heart and saying his God. Question. Got 12 minutes. Help me, Holy Spirit. Got a question for y'all. How many things have we felt strongly about but come to find out they were not of God? <laughs> How many things have we felt strongly about but come to find out they were not God? <laughs> Coco G said everything. <laughs> <laughs> right why why we're still following our heart if it's deceived us mm -hmm. so many times i know i have i have made a lot of bad decisions got a second question for you got a got a, got a second question for you what has happened since then besides you growing older what i mean is if you have identified that your heart has deceived you more than one time. Your feelings have deceived you. Your emotions have deceived you more than one time. What has happened up until this point? Meaning, have you went to counseling? You have a mentor? Have you gotten closer to God? Has your devotion life gone through? An elevation? If none of that has happened, why are you still trusting your heart, your feelings, and emotions? You just, this stuff just don't happen. God takes you through a season of development where he say, hey, I want you to feel, but I don't want you to be led by your emotions. Your emotions don't know your future. Ooh, 10 minutes. Come on through, Holy Spirit. This is just me. This is just my own personal conviction. Don't take this. Don't write this down. Don't write this down. This is not Bible. This is just my own personal conviction. This is just my opinion. I think some, some, not all, because somebody going to be in the comments. It ain't all churches. I didn't say it was all churches. Some, I'm just generally speaking. I think some churches actually teach us to be led by our feelings. This is what I mean, because some of us don't identify or don't respond to the spirit of the Lord unless we're crying or we got chills. 
You may not be crying right now and you may not have chills. That does not mean God is not here. But because we go to church and we just praise and we fall out and we shout and we dance, it's all, um, it's all emotion. It ain't always an announcement of the Holy Spirit. But you correlate an emotional response to the Holy Spirit and that's not always the case. The Holy Spirit right now is all over your boy. But I ain't cried not one tick, not, not one time. I'm not going to cry. God is with me whether I give an emotional response to him or not. But we condition people to think if I'm not crying or the Holy Spirit, if I don't have chills, that the Holy Spirit ain't with me. God said I'm more than a feeling anyway. Why are you trying to box me in with what y'all do for 15 to 20 minutes at worship? I'm with you at work. I'm with you while you drive. I'm with you in the shower. I'm with you at the basketball game. You ain't got to cry. You don't have to have chills. I'm still with you. But that we were taught that. So now we, we don't thank God with us because we don't feel him. I don't, Bridget, I don't know if the Lord is with me. I just don't feel him. We, we, we. And some of us get offended because I say, uh, that's good for a season for you to always cry when you're in the presence of the Lord. That's okay for a season. And I was like that for a long time. Every time the spirit come upon me, I'm crying. <laughs> That's okay for a season. Don't get stuck there because every time Jesus ran up on Mary, every time Jesus ran up on Peter, every time Jesus ran up on Mark, they were not crying, but yet they was in the presence of the Lord. How you out here doing ministry is supposed to be helping God's people and you can't control your emotions. All you do is want to cry. Baby, we got work to do. We ain't, we ain't got time to be crying. Okay, got work to do. We got work to do. That's just my own personal conviction. I think we, we are cultivating emotionalism in some of the churches today. And because people falling out and shouting don't mean that it's the Holy Spirit. Sometimes. It's all following his heart. Blind on God, tell my God did. God has got David where we want him, according to Saul. Verse 8. So Saul mobilized his entire army to march to Keilah and besiege David and his men. Verse 9 says, But David learned of Saul's plan and told Abiathar the priest to bring the ephod and ask the Lord what he should do. Then David prayed, O Lord, God of the nation, I have heard that Saul is planning to come and destroy Keilah because I am here. Will the leaders of Keilah betray me to him? And will Saul actually come as I have heard? O oh Lord, God of nation, please tell me. And the Lord said he will come. Again, David asked, will the leaders of Keilah betray me and my men to Saul? And the Lord replied, yes. They will betray you. Saul mobilized his entire army to march to Keilah to besiege David. Because of Saul's hate towards David, he is compromising the well-being of the men of his army over his personal agenda. Bro, you're not sending your men out to fight the enemy, the Philistines. It's because you have a per personal hate towards David. You're using resources that the Lord sent to you for your own personal gain. We are guilty about doing that in the kingdom. When we are overly emotional, we compromise the well-being of others. Verse 9 says that David learned of Saul's plan and told Abiathar, the priest, to bring the ephod. Check this out. David heard. Verse 9 says, David learned of Saul's plan. What is Saul's plan? To come get you, my boy. Yeah, I got a whole army. I'm coming at your throat. I'm coming at your head. But what did David do? What did David do? What did David do? He consulted with God. What would you do? Match energies? He coming for me? I'm coming for him. He cursed me out? I'm going to curse him out. He make a video about me. I'm going to make a video about him. Matching energies. 
David did not match energies. Kings don't match energies. Matching energies is emotionalism. You got to get the last lick. And you're going to have a temper tantrum if you don't have the last lick or get the last word. You don't need the Holy Spirit to match energies. Kings don't match energies. We do what David did right here in verse 9. He consulted with God when he heard about King Saul was coming at him. He prayed. O Lord of Israel, I have heard that Saul is planning to come and destroy Keilah. Because I am here. Will the leaders of Keilah betray me? Hold up, bro. Hold up. Hold up. Will the, hold, hold up, bro. David asked God, will the people of Keilah betray me? These are the same folks he just saved. These are the same folks that David saved from the Philistines. These are the people you just helped. These are the people you just mentored. These are the people you just discipled. These are the people that you sat on the phone with for three or four hours. Betrayed him. What did God say? Yes, they will betray you. They will betray you. Some of y'all in the community going to betray me. But guess what? I'm going to be okay. I'll be okay. Why? Because I'm not led by my emotions. I still got to do ministry. I still got to help people. I still got purpose. I still got the Holy Spirit. But many of us would tap out right here because of our feelings. All I did for those people at their church. All I did for them. They betrayed me. They talked about me. They gossiped about me. But you talking about you ready for ministry. This is the part of ministry that we don't talk about. Folks will betray you. That's why I always encourage people to go through process and allow God to cultivate this management of your emotions before you out here trying to do ministry. You don't understand that them folks go betray you. And if you aren't emotionally intelligent, you're going to be in your closet crying when you really supposed to. Yeah, that part. Verse 13 and 14. So David and his men, about 600 of them, now they left Keilah and began roaming the countryside. Word soon reached Saul that David had escaped. So he didn't go to Keilah after all. David now stayed in the strongholds of the wilderness and in the hill country of Zilph. Saul hunted him day after day, but God didn't let Saul find him. We see right here in verse 4, verse 13, David numbers increased from 400 to 600. When you are doing in the when you are in the will of the Lord and you are obeying, God will increase. So I speak increase over every individual that's on this live. Whatever God has placed in your hand, may he grace you to multiply it. Anointing, multiply it. Influence, multiply it. Favor, multiply it. Peace, revelations, money, healing, ideals, creativity. Increase it, God, right now in the name of Jesus. But also when you're in the will of the Lord and you're obedient and you're not being led by your emotions, you don't have a reason to match energy. Because it says right here in verse six, verse 14, Saul hunted him day after day, but God didn't let Saul find him. God didn't let Saul find him. My prayer is, Lord, keep me hidden from the enemy. Lord, as long as I'm doing what you want me to do, as long as I'm helping your people, as long as I'm seeking your face, Lord, at least I'm when I'm trying to do right, even though I may be frustrated, I may be confused, but Lord, keep me hidden from the enemy. Keep me hidden from COVID. Keep me hidden from gossip. Keep me hidden from rumors, depression, anxiety, cancer, high blood pressure, exhaustion. 
Offense, pride, emotionalism. Keep me hidden, God. Keep me hidden from resentment, bitterness, lust, religion. Hide me, O oh God. When you are in the will of God, God will prevent those things from finding you. But you got to make sure that you are, are aligned with him. And I'm going to get up out of here. You got any questions? Put them in the comments. When we allow God to lead us instead of our own understanding, instead of our feelings, instead of our emotions, God is obligated to keep you hidden from the enemy. He's obligated to protect you because you're doing what he called you to do. If it's his will, it's his bill. I'll say that again. If it's his will, it's his bill. And we only think about money when we say that. But no, when you are doing the will of the Lord, it's his, it's his obligation to keep you in good health. It's his obligation to sustain your relationship. It's his obligation to protect those and keep your family hidden from the enemy. It's his obligation to cover you in his blood when you are submitted and doing his will. If it's his will, it's his bill. Twice we saw in the text what David consulted with God because he was being attacked. He was being betrayed. He's being betrayed by Saul. He's being betrayed by the people at Keilah. And both times, what, he, what did he do? He consulted with the law, with the Lord. We have to renew our minds. Allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds. And remember, the renewal and the transformation takes place in your devotion. Your spent time with God and he will reprogram how you think. Instead of you responding to life from, e from an emotional place, God will renew your mind to where you respond to his word, to his obedience, to the Holy Spirit. And a lot of us skip this development stage, and that's why we're so emotional. That's why we mishandle people. That's why we can't effectively do marriage, ministry, or anything else that the kingdom consists of because we still idolize our feelings. I know you're a woman. I know you got estrogen, but the Holy Spirit don't care nothing about that. I'm an introvert. The Holy Spirit don't care nothing about that. I'm a black man. The Holy Spirit don't care nothing about that. He trumps your hormones. He trumps your childhood. Yeah, I grew up and was taught and conditioned to suppress my emotions. To feel, don't, don't, don't cry. But the Holy Spirit said, I don't care nothing about that, bro. You know how many times I was in my closet face down? With Kleenex, with a Kleenex bo box next to my face. Yeah, I'm in my closet. Yeah, in 2017, I probably cried more in one year than I cried in my entire life besides being a baby. Because the Holy Spirit said, I'm breaking them walls off of your heart. I'm breaking them chains. I'm breaking how you was brought up as a child. I need you to feel, my boy. I need you to feel. You can't look out for my people if you, if you don't feel. You can't be a husband if you don't feel. You can't be a wife if you don't feel. You can't have compassion. You can't have empathy. If you don't allow me to, to break these walls off of your heart. So I pray, Lord, those stony parts of our heart. Replace them with flesh. The chains that we have on our hands, on our feet, on our mindsets. Lord, break them. Allow your Holy Spirit to come in and renew our mind because we can't effectively love you or love your people the way that we need to if we are still being led by our emotions. I pray that this word was unveiling for us that the blind spots that we have often overlooked in the kingdom with this emotionalism. This emotionalism is programming us to only respond by how we feel and what we have been. The emotionalism is messing us up in the kingdom and ain't nobody talking about it.
No one talking about how the saints idolize our emotions. When we submit our emotions to God, it is then, only then, submit your emotions to the Holy Spirit. Submit them to God. Put them on the altar. So God, I, I, I invite you into my life to check my emotions. Lord, you said in your word, do not lean on our own understanding. Lord, you said in your word that we should not walk by sight, but by faith. God, we invite you into our lives to help us, to guide us into the renewing of our minds. Because the majority of our life, we've been led by our emotions. We didn't take the wisdom from the Bible. We didn't take the wisdom from the Holy Spirit. We took the wisdom from, from the world that told us to follow our hearts, to tell us to date off of a vibe, to connect with people off of the energy. Now, we're not saying don't feel. That is not what God is saying. He's not saying don't feel. He's not saying don't cry. He's not saying that. What he's saying is don't be led. By your emotions. Because kings. If you want to operate like a king. If you want to operate like a queen. If you want to walk in the calling. Where God trusts you with purpose. Trust you with marriage. Trust you with divine relationships. Trust you with the promotion. Trust you with the house. Trust you with the kids. You got to allow him to renew your mind to where you're not responding to life solely based off of your emotions. That's how kings do it. Like a king. Like a queen. Let's do a better job of managing our emotions. And when I know you can't do this in your own strength. I'm telling you, it's tied to your devotion. It's tied to your devotion. Time spent with God. So that may involve you getting off Netflix. That may involve you not traveling as much. That may involve you getting off social media. That may involve you unplugging and spending more time with the Lord. Because you, we should be exhausted and tired of getting caught in these cycles where our emotions has led us down a road of destruction. Well, maybe the destruction don't bother you. But we getting too old to keep wasting time. Aren't you tired of wasting time? Aren't you tired of wasting time? Emotions, being led by your emotions, don't do nothing but waste time. I don't know about you, but I ain't got no time to waste. Kings don't waste time. With people who are seeking to get a relationship with God, when we understand the concept of sacrifice when it comes to relationship, the only thing we want to give to God is sin. The only thing we want to give up is sin. That's where we're messing up at. Because we have conditioned and taught people to only focus on sin. But what I talked about tonight is not sin, per se. Your emotions aren't a sin. But let me tell you something. When you start to get close to God, he's going to address your idols. He's more concerned about your idols. All idols are not sins. Netflix, not a sin. Social media, not a sin. Food, not a sin. Your emotions aren't sins. But all you want to lay on the altar is, Lord, I ain't going to smoke no more. Lord, I ain't going to have no more sex. Lord, I ain't going to do this. I ain't going to do that. No, God said, I want, what are you placing before me? Put that on the altar. Your emotions, that's an idol. But because it's not a sin, we don't address it. So we'll say, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't smoke anymore. You know, I don't, I'm not going to get any more tattoos. You know? No, what about your emotions? Put them on the altar. Yeah, them emotions. Yeah, it's a process. It's going to take some time. I'm not saying it's going to happen overnight. But God 
is going to teach you how to manage your emotions. You think I tell y'all to stay out the comment section, arguing with people for no reason? No, I'm telling you that because I'm teaching you how to manage your emotions. Just because someone posts something that you disagree with, you ain't got to say nothing. That's an opportunity for you to train yourself to not respond impulsively because you disagree with someone. Because let me tell you something. If you're out here doing ministry, if you want to be married, marriage is a ministry. They ain't going to always agree with you. And it's not a green light for you to always respond from your emotions. Learn it now. Learn it now. But we place so much energy into arguing with folks and we looking very fleshy out here. You don't need the Holy Spirit to argue. Just because you got a new revelation don't mean you need to be walking around saying, oh, that's pagan. Okay, it's pagan. Keep it moving. This is a season where you're being developed, so you don't have time to go back and forth in the comment section worried about whether or not Valentine's Day is a pagan. No. Go to the Bible and read it. Don't worry about that. Learn to be quiet. It's going to bless you. I promise you. You're going to be less exhausted. You're going to be less offended. And I'm so appreciative of y'all hanging out with your boy tonight. As I said, I'll repost this on my YouTube, Reggie Taylor 704. Please go over there and subscribe. I'm trying to get my numbers up to where I can start going live over there as well. Follow me up over my other social media platforms. Hashtag Reflections of Reggie. Your boy go pop up. YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Go ahead and follow your boy over this platform. If you have an unction to give, uh, my cash out and my PayPal is REGG1414. REGG1414. My Venmo is Reggie Taylor 14. No, I'm not from Charlotte. Um, also, I want to let everyone to know that's been sowing, tithing, offering. I'm very appreciative. I want to let y'all know what I do when I normally see your seed come through. I immediately pray over that word, over that seed. I immediately open heaven on your behalf as well as everyone that's connected to you. I'm fully confident that if you're sowing into this ministry that you that you know that this is good ground. Um, I appreciate y'all trusting me with your seed. Some of us aren't connected to churches, but as I stated earlier, and I always say tithing and offering is an act of worship. Um, it's sacrificing to the Lord. Um, the church, the local church has done a poor job of explaining to people the principle and the whole concept was behind tithing and offering. Now, a lot of us can't really submit our emotions to the Lord because we hadn't practiced first with our money. Money is the lowest form of sacrifice. When you start to sacrifice the Lord with your finances, it's easy for you to put your emotions on the altar. It's easy for you to put those relationships on the altar. But a lot of us love our emotions and love money so much that we say, oh, God, you can touch everything else except my finances. So for the ones who are willingly worshiping God, sacrificing to him, not saying that you're obligated to do it. I just want to let the ones who are sowing into the ministry, sowing into this good ground and sowing into the kingdom that I'm very appreciative. And I'm letting you know what happens on my end when I do see your seed come through to my cash out, my PayPal or my um. Venmo. Just want to let y'all know. God, we thank you for this word. We thank you for this platform. We thank you that you have opened our eyes to some of the blind spots that we may have uh, individually as well as in the kingdom. God, we pray that you continue to give us the ability to manage our emotions. You said in your word that we should walk by faith and not by sight and we should be led by your spirit. That the word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, we want to lay these feelings, these energies, these vibes, how we were brought up, God, that's causing us to head down these roads of destruction. God, we want to allow you to correct us, to renew our mind, to not conform to the ways of the world. And we know it's not going to happen overnight, 
but we want you to increase the conviction within us. Whenever we start to respond to life from an emotional place, and we understand that we should feel, but we should not be led by our emotions. We don't want to choose partners. We, we don't want to choose to do ministry. We don't want to choose where to work. We don't want to choose where to live without consulting with you. And even if we are betrayed or we are having to endure persecution, it's by the power of your Holy Spirit that we will not respond in an emotional way. Because we saw tonight when David heard that King Saul was about to attack him, he did not match energies. He consulted with you. He turned to you. So, Lord, reprogram our priorities and our default to turn to you in every situation, in every aspect of our lives. God, we submit our emotions and our feelings and our understanding. We throw them at your feet. Our emotions, our feelings and our understanding, we throw them at your feet. We bow to you, God. We surrender to you and we submit to you. We thank you, God, for this word. We thank you for this community. We thank you for the increase. But you said it to, in your word tonight, Lord, that you will increase everything that you put in our hands. Whether it be finances, anointing, gifting, peace, grace, mercy. Everything that hits our hand, Lord, we want, to incre we want you to increase it. We thank you that you are elevating yourself within our life and anything that's not like you, God, we're we're expecting you to consume it and to burn it up and to remove it. God, heal our hearts. Some of us have hard hearts, God, but we want a heart of flesh. We want to be able to feel. We want to be able to have compassion. We want to have empathy towards others. We want to have a kingdom mindset to where we don't make decisions that compromise the well-being of your people and your kingdom shift our minds shift our hearts shift our feelings thank you god for this shifting that's going to take place it's already done we're going to speak those things that aren't as though they were we know that the same spirit that raised christ from the dead is within us holy spirit have your way we thank you for your spirit we thank you for your word we thank you for your revelations and we thank you for your blood. And we thank you for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.